Good morning. Good morning. It's no secret, um, if you've known me for long, that I love animals. I absolutely love animals. I've worked with animals uh, for a long time as well, and I just got a couple pictures here. This is a raccoon, by far one of my favorite animals of all time. I try to befriend any raccoon I come across, Hannah is a witness. They like me. They usually come up to me if I sit there long enough, and then other people scare them off. But uh, I'm like Buddy in uh, Elf. You know, he walks up to the raccoon, gets bit up, uh, kind of like that. Otters, that's one of my wife's favorite animals. And uh, I got a turtle that came across my parents' neighborhood that I tried to feed and hang out with for a while, sat down and just watched him move along. Um, this is my dog, the little black one, that's Sally, and that's her Aunt Bella right there. There are two peas in a pod. This is Scout, one of the dogs I worked with. And it's funny, I worked with these dogs, and, and the thing I learned is dogs do not have one uniform personality. Like, they're all very distinct beings. They have different personalities, different attributes, and it's just funny observing that. It's been even cooler because I've, I like, ran into some of these pet owners just in my normal day-to-day -day life, like in neighborhoods or running errands, and they're out with their dog, and then their dog will run up to me because they recognize me, even from years back. And the owner's like, do you know my dog? I'm like, yeah. I used to take care of him like every day. I had him wash him, everything else. Just some more dogs. I threw in some cats just for the cat people. I don't like cats. I can do it. Yeah, they're, they're all right. But just for, for the cat people, these are the ones I worked with as well. And, of course, the lamb. And lambs are just about the softest, cutest animals you have ever come across. They're adorable, and I, I don't like eating lamb for that reason, because they're so cute, and it makes me sad, right, where that comes from. But the question remains, why are all these critters here, right? Like, why, why do they exist? Why do they share this earth with us? And if we go to our Bibles in Genesis 129, it says, and God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. So if your answer was food, not originally so, <laughs> all right? So humans didn't originally eat animals for food. They ate plants. They were vegetarians. In verse 30, it says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that, is, that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So animals didn't eat other animals. They also ate plants. In verse 31, it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. This is God's ideal world that he made, where there's no death. There's just humans and animals coexisting and eating plants. If we go to chapter 2 and verse 18, by the way, I'm not saying it's a sin to eat meat. That's where we're, we're going to see that in a second. But Genesis 2, 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Verse 19, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So what was the need? Companionship, friendship. What did God make? Animals. So animals were originally designed to be mankind's companions to be their friends, their furry buddies, right? That's why, you ever heard the expression, uh, dogs are a man's best friend? Yeah, <laughs> there, there we go. It's the, the OG friend, right? That's like the first friend was animals. And then if we fast forward, we remember the flood. And I want us to really think about this for a moment. The flood where it wiped out all living creatures, and except for eight people, right? Eight humans out of all the humanity that existed. You realize more animals were saved in the flood than humans? You ever think about that? Why would God care to preserve animals, even over humans, at this time? I think there's a very good point to just pointing out the fact that animals are innocent, right? Humankind had acted wickedly. Now, Noah was blameless because of his faith in God, but the animals, they committed no sin. They were perfectly innocent. But then after Noah comes back and the earth has been cleansed and renewed, in Genesis 9, verse 2, Mr. Gist talked about this last Sunday, it says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea into your hand, they are delivered. Now, notice what God did there. Have you ever walked up to a critter and wonder why it like, runs away so fast when it sees a human approaching? That's a defense mechanism that God equipped them with from us. Now, it's fair game. God says you can eat them, but also I'm going to give them a sporting chance. <laughs> I'm going to put the fear of you all into them. 
And so we see that something has changed here. Verse 3 says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. What kind of God not only makes a covenant with lower human beings, right, who are no, nowhere near his glory, that they're finite beings, but a God who also makes covenant with critters, with, with, <laughs> right, with dogs, with raccoons, with turtles, that he made a covenant with these creatures as well. In verse 16, it says, When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh, that is on the earth. So we see just an insight into the tenderness and the care that God has not only for humanity, but for his created beings that he's filled this earth with, originally for companionship, and now we can also eat them, but he gives them a sporting chance. So when the earth was very good, animals were not for food, they were made as friends. God cared enough to create them, preserve them, and make a covenant with them. And if we fast forward into Job, in Job 38, 26, I want us to think about the, uh, po the, the beautiful ideas here. It says, to bring rain on land where no man is. This is God speaking about how he sustains lands that humans don't even see, don't even enjoy. And he's saying, you, you don't even see all the things I do and I preserve. These secret places on the earth where no human touches, no human sees, yet I preserve them. And I fill it with life. On the desert in which there is no man. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thickets? Verse 41, who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wonder about for lack of food? See, there's a lot of animals that are a lot smarter than people. I've never made, met an atheistic animal. Right? They, they just know intuitively that there's a God. In verse 1 of chapter 39, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving, the calving of the do does? Who has left the wild donkey go free? Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey? To whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for his dwelling place. We're skipping around in chapter 39. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley. You ever see a horse do that? Just start trampling. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. So God still sustains the creatures that he designed with all their peculiarities and personalities. You see, all these attributes are unique to those animals, right? God's given them personalities. He's given them feelings. In chapter 49, of, in verse 5 of Genesis, I want you to notice how humans sometimes are cruel to God's creatures. It says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. And this is a curse he places on them. He says, let my soul come not into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company, for in their anger they killed men. That's really bad, right? But secondly, and in their willfulness, they hamstrung oxen. Just acts of animal cruelty for no reason. This is disdainful. This is deplorable in God's sight, right? These are cruelty. These are wrong things. In Deuteronomy 25.4, there's laws given even about the treatment of animals. You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. Feed your animals, right? They're working for you. Feed them. Don't remove food until they get the job done. Let them eat while they're getting the job done. What kind of God cares about instituting a law for a people and how they care for their animals? In, jo in uh, Jonah 4.10, famous passage, it says, And the Lord said, You pity the plant. Remember, Jonah's just furious. He's absolutely furious that God would have the gall to show mercy to this Gentile nation. And he's furious about it, that God didn't, is not destroying them like he thought he promised. He says, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. Realize that when God holds, holds up the cosmic scales, 
one of the factors is animal life as well in his judgment. And Proverbs 12.10, this is one of my favorite Bible verses, you can guess why. Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his pet or his animal or his creature. But the mercy of the wicked is cruel. So the one who is righteous cares about a lot of things. When we think about righteousness, it's all about right relationships. Right relationship with God, right relationship with fellow humans. But the righteous also have right relationships with their animals, that they feed them, they take care of them. But notice that even the mercy, what, what bit of mercy that the wicked could, scrout, could scrout, you know, gather together, even that is cruel. Whatever mercy they have, even that is cruelty. So it's a parallel right there. In Isaiah 66, 3, it says, He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. Right? God's talking about the day when these sacrifices will no longer be needed. And he's saying slaughtering ox will be like killing a man. Right, And that's distasteful. God does not want that. He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. You ever seen I Am Legend? You know that one scene that's like, oh. Like that, it's very disgusting. It just hits you to your core. And God's saying, it's that repulsive to me. And notice that the metaphor he uses is something that he assumes we also will find repulsive. Killing a man, snapping a dog's neck, that's just things you don't do, right? You don't treat innocent creatures like that. So the Son of Man, who we know is the exact imprint of God's nature, came to earth. And he even had some things to say about animals. I want you to notice this. In Luke 12, 6, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? So he's saying these sparrows that fly in the sky, y'all sell them for two pennies, which isn't much, right? So we don't have that much value, right, for, for birds. It's just a bird. Yet God knows every single bird that has fallen out of the sky that exists. But what about sacrifices, right? Because there's a lot of animals that died. Like, look at the institution of the temple, right? There's like thousands and thousands and thousands. It was like a genocide. It was like a cow genocide that happened at the dedication of the temple. That goes back to Leviticus 5 and verse 6. It says, he shall bring the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for, uh, for him for his sin. And I think we just read that and just assume that they would have just grown cold to that or accustomed to that. I don't think that's the case, especially when you read about David and how he took care of his flock and how you see the, the story of uh, when Nathan the prophet rebukes him. Remember the man who had that lamb that was just like his only, that was like a child to him, right? That ate out of his own, off his own table. You know, you're not supposed to let your dog on the table, but it's like he let this lamb at, at his table to eat of his food. And just you think about if you had to grab a lamb and actually take the knife and cut its throat, I imagine that wouldn't, that's not something you could do callously. I'm sure there was just something innately that felt wrong about it or, or painful about it or that just, it gnawed at you, right? That it bothered you. But what was the purpose? There's a special word there, atonement or covering. Why was it necessary? Well, we know from other scriptures that because of sin, the wages or compensation of sin is death. And Jesus said that we are of much more value than the animals. So yes, God does have a higher value for us, thankfully, right? Very thankful for that. But that doesn't mean God does not care about animals. He creates them. He sustains them. He gives them their personalities. So the point is, God allowed innocence to suffer for guilty sinners. It wasn't we sacrifice them because they don't matter. It was God saying, I will allow innocence to suffer because of what you did. Because of your failings, I will allow innocence to suffer to cover over what you have done. And why is this? Because for some reason, God is steadfast in his love for his human imagers. He's made a covenant with them. He wants to provide for them. He wants to purify them. So do we stop to think about the fact that Jesus himself is compared to an animal. And that metaphor is there for a reason, because it's a perfect metaphor, metaphor of innocence. When we think of animals, they're sinless. They're guiltless. In Isaiah 53, 7, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Now, is that, oh, big deal, it's just a lamb getting led to the slaughter, who cares? No, there's no callousness there. It's a heart-wrenching metaphor of innocent suffering. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In John 1.29, remember when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming? It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the ultimate example of innocence suffering for the guilty. All those things exist for a reason. It's telling a story. In Revelation 12, 9, this is very fascinating. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. So what is, this, <laughs> what is Satan compared to in the animal kingdom? A serpent, right? A snake. The deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. If you go to verse 11, it says, And they have conquered him, that serpent, by what? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So Jesus, in all his glory, in, in Revelation, guess what doesn't drop? The Lamb. Why? Because you see the innocence the, the beauty, right? <laughs> There's, they're, they're, they're beautiful, they're innocent. But what the amazing thing is, the cool thing is that, you know, the sword that comes out of his mouth and he doesn't even have to move and all the enemies are defeated. But the point being that innocence suffered for guilty sinners. As innocent as animals are, Jesus was even more so. He was even more pure. He was even more guiltless. And he was even more beloved by the Father. And the Father gave his lamb, the innocence, the beauty, in the person of Jesus. And he sent him to walk on this earth so that sorry losers like you and I can spend eternity with him, can have presence with him. The only way to overcome that ancient serpent and sin is by the blood of the lamb. And interestingly... This is this just makes me scratch my head so much. You know how they make uh, anti-venom? What they make it out of? Lamb's blood. Lamb's blood. Lamb's blood is used as anti-venom to serpent bite. Who conquered the serpent in Revelation? Those who were washed in the blood of the lamb. We have our anti-venom. The sting of death is gone. Right? It gets us, but we've been washed in the blood, and so we can overcome the power of death through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Mark 14, 22, it says, And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I've, there's been many dark days for me in my past when I didn't have too many people to talk to, and it was like before Hannah and everything else, and I've been, you know, just living by myself and everything else, and there was just something so comforting about my little buddy, Sasha, you know, she'd get up, she'd sit in my lap, she'd hug on me, everything else, she'd lay up right by my head, and there was just this, you know, this, this closeness, you felt comforted, you felt loved, and I can't imagine I really can't. I, I would, I'm pretty convinced. I can't say because I've been in the situation, but I would probably give her what little food I had left. If I had like no food left, I'd split it and I'd give it to us both. That's just how my brain works. That's just how connected I am to animals. And there's very few things I would sacrifice <laughs> my animal for. Very, very few things. I'm not even sure about myself. Definitely for Hannah, but, but, not, but I'm not sure and I just can't imagine that for whatever attachment and, and things like that, imagine how the father felt for his son, how God felt for Jesus. To just be separate from him, knowing what, lied, what, what was going to happen, knowing that evil and the darkness would be outpoured on him on the cross, knowing that he would cry out, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Hearing his son cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That had to hurt. 
And why did he do it? You, me. Because he valued that relationship with you. He wanted to bring you in to the fold. He wanted you to be one of the sheep in his flock. And we just, we can't, we do this so often that it, it gets routine and sometimes the emotion goes away and the intellectualism comes in, right? And it becomes a, quite a cerebral thing. But I just want you to think about that attachment, what the father gave up, what the son gave up, the pain he went through so that you can be in that fold. So that we can overcome the serpent's venom through the blood of the lamb. Let's pray before we partake. Our God, we are forever humbled that you created all things. You created the universe, solar systems, galaxies, gravity, cells, creatures, dogs, turtles, and us. And Father, we are the only ones foolish enough that to disobey you, to think that we know the right way to rule, that we know the right way to live. And by living this way, by giving in to the serpent's voice, we've all chosen death. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of imaging you. And Father, you didn't leave us. You didn't abandon us. You didn't wipe us out. Instead, you sent your son, the most precious of all, to die for us. And Father, we thank you that you would be willing to undergo that pain, that you'd be willing to send your son, and that he would be willing to go through that pain to redeem a rebellious creation that is foolhardy, arrogant. And Father, we don't treat each other well. We don't treat our covenant with you well. And Father, help this be a time for us to reflect as we partake of your son's body and the bread. Lord, help us truly reflect and think about our lives and make sure that we are living true to our covenant with you that you sponsored through the death of your son. And it's in his, in his name we pray, amen. Let's pray. Father, we, all, we are also mindful of your son's blood that he shed on the cross. Now, this is the cup that we partake of, the antivenom to the sting of death, to the sting of the serpent. Father, we've chosen death, and you paid the price to bring us into the light, to give us life through your son. Father, help us reflect and be introspective as we partake of the cup. Please make things clear in our lives that we need to work on, areas we've fallen short. And help us also be joyful in the relationship that you have restored. Not of our doing, but by your will and the sacrifice of your son. Help us stay true to that covenant and rejoice in those blessings. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.